So the results are basically in for the 2020 United States presidential election, as well as how close the polls got it. And they were a disaster. Keep watching and we'll break it down. I'm Richard and this is Richard on Data. So a few weeks ago, I did a video on why I thought the polls, pollsters, and poll analysts were all basically incorrect, and how the election was probably a lot closer than conventional wisdom made it out to be. That video encouraged all kinds of very spirited comments, but there was a lot of good discussion there all around, and there were several requests for me to make a follow-up video. Well, the results are in now, and what I will say is, I made a prediction, kind of just for fun, at the end of my last video, about how I expected Trump was actually narrowly going to eke it out. Needless to say, that didn't happen. But having said all that, we do have a series of polling misses to look at now, and I think there's a lot to learn from this, whether you're a data scientist or whether you're just somebody who's a political junkie. Now in this video, I'm gonna talk about why, as a data scientist myself, who likes to think he knows a little bit about the underlying political domain, why exactly I thought the polls were wrong. Because yes, my approach to that certainly wasn't data-driven, at least in any strict sense, but it was inspired by the way that I look at data and models in the real world. And then naturally, I'll also talk about how I overcorrected and the assumptions that I personally made, which were incorrect too. And now that we can also sort of Monday morning quarterback the whole situation, I'll talk about some of the factors that polling might have missed this time around and how we might want to be thinking about this problem in the future. The other thing that I'll say though is this will probably be the last video that I make on this topic because once again, my channel name is Richard on Data and not Richard on Politics. And there's a reason for that. Before I get into all this, just some usual asks. Number one, subscribe to my channel if you haven't already and hit the notification bell so YouTube notifies you whenever I upload a video. Then take just half a second to smash the like button because that really does help my content reach a larger audience. And lastly, in the description of this video, I'll have a link to my Patreon account. So if you guys would be willing to support me over there, it would be massively appreciated. Now, without further ado, let's get started. So let's actually start with a disclaimer, which is that while there are things like recounts and lawsuits and things like that, which are happening in various states, it's happened in the past that things like that tip the scale by like a few hundred, maybe a thousand votes here and there, but it's very unlikely that you're gonna see any kind of significant change from where the results stand today. And where the results are is that Biden is at 306 electoral votes, Trump is at 232 electoral votes, and the margins in many of these states were incredibly close. Here's Arizona, which is a traditionally red state that broke for Biden this time by around 0.3%, or about 10,000 votes. Then this is Georgia, another state that hasn't gone blue since 1992. Biden also carried it by about 0.3%, or around 14,000 votes. And then here's Wisconsin. This is a state that Trump flipped in 2016. Now Biden took it back this time, but by a margin of about 0.6%, or 20,000 votes. There seemed to be consensus for a long time that this election was going to be a very easy Biden win. Biden was way ahead in the polls. The polls were a lot better than they were in 2016 because they realize now that college education versus not is a very important factor that explains uh, voting behavior. And so while those people were a lot harder to reach, you could just wait for college education and it would fix the polling issues. So how'd they do? Well, they were worse than they were in 2016. Here's a summary that Nate Silver put out on Twitter on this. So the polling errors included approximately Trump plus eight in Wisconsin, Trump plus seven in Iowa, Trump plus six in Florida, Trump plus five in Michigan, Trump plus five in Texas, and Trump plus five in Ohio. And that's just the presidential race. The Senate polling errors were even worse, a lot worse. 
To be fair, those are 538 polling averages. Now, if you go over to Real Clear Politics and look at their polling averages, those are a little bit closer. But again, these are averages though, which means there are individual polls which really didn't age well, such as this a plus poll from ABC News and Washington Post, which said that Trump was up by 17 points in the state of Wisconsin. So let me be blunt for a minute and put it this way. Suppose you or I were a data scientist and we're doing survey methodology and polling for some client. I don't want to say that we get fired for things like this because that's probably a bit of an exaggeration, but at the very least, the clients that we were working for would lose a lot of trust in us and frankly stop using our work. And yes, while it may be true the final prediction was correct in many of these places, as little as 0.6 points or more in polling error would have led to a completely dramatically different outcome. And so there are very open questions about what does this look like in future presidential races or even in our current Senate races. So I really don't want to let narrow victories in some of these states obscure the broader polling misses here. Now I made some assumptions about how various states were going to go myself, which turned out not to be true, so I'm not letting myself off the hook for this one either. But I did get one thing right, which was guessing that Trump was going to outperform the polls. So why exactly did I make guesses the way that I did? Well, it kind of came about through the same thought process that I would use for evaluating a real-life statistical or ML model, and there were three parts to it. First of all is looking at the raw data, which in this context, the closest analog to that is the polls themselves. Invariably, if you have bad data, you're going to make a bad model or you're going to make a bad forecast every single time. And quite frankly, when there's a poll out there that's saying that a state that voted for somebody one year and then swings against the same person four years later by 18 points in a polarized environment, I'm going to be really skeptical about that because that really doesn't make a lot of sense. Secondly, when you look at models and forecasts, it is really good to take some cases here and there, look at the forecast predictions that are coming out, and see if they look reasonable. And when I see things like Texas at a 40% chance for Biden, or things like Alaska and South Carolina in play when they weren't four years ago, I'm going to have a little bit of skepticism about that. Like, that might very well be true, but I'm going to be skeptical and take a second look at it. But the biggest thing of all to me was the early voting data. Now, I understand for established forecasters, it's not exactly straightforward how to incorporate this, but I look at this the way I do any kind of model, which is when I get new data, it can be the best gift in the world. Now, you could look at a state like Florida that tracks party registration and see that there was only a gap of 140,000 votes or so between registered Democrats and Republicans. This is from Target Smart. Now, we knew at the time that election day votes would favor Republicans pretty heavily, in part due to differing sentiments between parties on mail-in voting and the virus. And I thought, based on historical precedent and what the correlation has generally looked like in the past, that a win in Florida would translate to wins in Arizona and Georgia, and maybe even Pennsylvania as well. Obviously, that turned out not to be true. But I do stand by the idea that if you have this much new information, you would be a fool not to use it. One of the theories that I threw out there was that there's some fraction of the population that was planning to vote for Trump, but wasn't going to tell that to pollsters, aka the shy Trump voter effect. Now, is this a thing? Well, I think it almost certainly is, and there are good arguments both for and against the notion that it goes beyond Trump himself. It might have even extended to Republicans in general during this cycle, because you had multiple Senate Republicans who ran way ahead of their polls, even more so than Trump did. And this might have even extended also to candidates like Democratic Senator Bernie Sanders, and with him there's a case to be made he's polarizing in his own way, but there are multiple counts of him dramatically overperforming primary polls. 
It's also a fair counterpoint that there were some races that were kind of off in 2018, but not nearly as much so as in 2016 and 2020. So there is some credence to the idea that weird stuff happens when Trump is on the ballot. I tend to think it goes a little bit beyond Trump, but we may just have to wait a few cycles to see what happens. At the end of the day, response bias and social desirability bias do exist in many different phenomena, and I do think it's a little bit myopic to at least not consider them a little bit. There's a detailed article by political science professor Eric Kaufman that came out a few days after the election, and he pondered this a little bit, and he came up with the hypothesis that yes, the shy Trump voter does exist. In particular, it's in college-educated whites, particularly females. In particular, part of the crux of his argument is that actually education level was not the super important predictor that pollsters seem to think it was when they looked back on 2016, but in fact that feelings on things like illegal immigration explained a huge proportion of variation in the Trump versus Clinton support in a way that the college education level doesn't. So really, you'd have to wait on things like attitude and psychology, and these aren't exactly easy things to do. And he also cites a study going all the way back to 2010 that found social desirability massively influenced expressed sentiment on immigration. Specifically, that the share of white Americans willing to endorse zero new immigration jumped from 39% to 60% when the question was concealed inside of a list. This is a pretty interesting theory, and it's worth looking at this within the context of another specific part of the polling phenomenon. And that's that when some of these polls looked at white voters in general, some of them actually got white voters without college degrees pretty close to perfect, actually. But where they did get it wildly wrong was with white voters with college degrees, as in wrong by like 26 to 31 points. So if you do have a shy Trump voter effect, it's probably in there somewhere. To be clear, this definitely does not tell the whole story. And actually one other item that I think is worth paying a lot of attention to is location. Now just to introduce this idea, I'd like to look at a poll from the New York Times and Siena and a great piece that was done on it by journalist Nate Cohn. And to give credit to him and to that organization, they are very transparent about the way that they conduct their polls. And specifically, I want to look at the Rust Belt here because the polls got that wrong in 2016 and in 2020, and it is, at this point anyway, one of the most decisive regions of the country. They conducted a poll where actually they purposely oversampled people who voted for Trump in 2016, and they wanted to get an idea of if people were switching in what direction they were going. Now I'm going to try to paint a picture of what I think the biggest issue here is and try to make it clear even for those of you who don't live in these states or in the US in general even. Now once again, in this poll, there are more people who voted for Trump in 2016 than those who voted for Clinton overall. Now I think one big standout here that you can pretty easily see is that red and blue are generally relatively evenly distributed geographically throughout this map. However, you can look at this map of where these geographical locations went in 2020, and frankly, this actually is extremely similar to what it looked like in 2016, and to some extent, even 2012. And you'll see that the blue tends to be concentrated in pockets, particularly in densely populated or more urban areas, while the red is more spread out in a larger number of much smaller, more sparsely populated areas. Those are typically the more rural areas. So if I can go back to Nate Cohn's analysis here, one thing that catches my eye is the fact that a lot of the Democrats they sampled seem to come from Republican heavy areas and the exact same thing vice versa. Now it happens all the time that a geographical area or region shifts left or right over time as the conditions and the people there change, but still, certainly in the short term at least, where a region has been in the past is some indicator of where it's going to be in the future. 
People in various regions and communities are typically going to be driven by similar economic factors, like what types of businesses are in that area, and probably by some degree of cultural factors as well. And these things just typically don't change overnight. And to be entirely fair, this is just one poll, and I'm pinpointing one specific issue with it, but I do think that it illustrates a broader point. And also, you might be thinking, just like I did, would spread of the virus that's happening in that area affect how it voted? And the answer to that is, it's a lot more complicated than you might think, but probably not. So the virus and various metrics like new cases and hospitalizations were on the rise at the time the election occurred, even when early mail-in votes started to come in. And it's not exactly a secret that Trump's approval rating on handling of this issue has not been very high. And in particular, it's actually decreased by about 10 points since the issue really began here in the U.S. around March. But this analysis from Edison Research, which was reported in Vox, found that actually many people perceive there to be a dichotomy between the pandemic and its resulting economic fallout, and that people's views on this were highly polarized across partisan lines. And similarly, there wasn't a super clear relationship between the new cases per million, at least at the state level, and where its vote broke. My two cents on this are that this issue almost definitely damaged Trump electorally, but it is incredibly difficult to estimate exactly how much and where exactly. And overall, I have to say that my biggest takeaway is that it's well known these polls control for factors like party affiliation, age, race, and to some extent gender, which have in the past anyway been well known at predicting how one is going to vote. Recently, they're doing more to incorporate college education level as well. But there are a huge number of factors out there that can probably explain how people vote. Location is one that I made a point on in this video that I think could potentially be huge and should probably be handled in a more nuanced way rather than rural versus suburban versus urban. There's views on particular specific issues like the immigration issue I pointed out earlier. Maybe there's things like type of job. Is it blue collar versus white collar? What's the religious affiliation? What's the income level? There are all these things out there which some polling organizations probably control for more so than others. Granted, I certainly don't know what all those different things are. But I do really think at the end of the day, the same features that we used in the past to explain variation in voting behavior aren't working quite as well now, and we need to look at different features going forward. Then once we figure out what those features actually are, the next step is figuring out how to actually measure these things appropriately, which could be a challenge in its own right. So who knows how accurate polls, pollsters and poll analysts are going to be in the future, in particular while we have a constantly changing world around us. But I do have a strong suspicion that this is going to go over just like any other complex data science problem. That knowing how to attack the problem and make models better is primarily going to be driven by domain knowledge. That is, a better understanding of the country and the people in it than it's going to be from tweaking models and algorithms. What do you guys think? Why do you think that the 2020 polls were off? And then do you think that the polls are going to improve or that they're going to continue to worsen? Leave your comments down below. As always, try to be civil about it. Thanks for watching this video, and if you enjoyed it, please consider sharing this video and smashing the like button. And then I'll see you all in the not-so-distant future. Until then, Richard, on data.